Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Justin Logan. I'm the Director of Defense and Foreign Policy Studies here at Cato. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon for our book forum for John J. Mearsheimer and Sebastian Rosado's book, How States Think, The Rationality of Foreign Policy. Um, despite being by a country mile the least distinguished person on the podium today, um, I am occasionally asked by young people, interns and whatnot, um, how to do this kind of work, uh, how to conduct policy analysis, how to do political science. Um, and I always tell them one piece of advice um, that I think I've learned uh, over the years, and that is to take big swings, right? Life is too short to spend your days asking the distinctions between seven different reform proposals for narrow bureaucratic slivers of the European Union of which no one's ever heard. Um, and I think, in part, I learned the take big swings lesson um, from watching the career of John J. Mearsheimer. Um, good books ask big questions um, and cause you to think more deeply about a subject, even if you don't agree with everything in the book. Um, that is, I think, if you look at the career of John Mearsheimer, um, clearly uh, a lesson that I've learned, again, from him. Um, by that standard, this book is a good book. Um, I found myself alternately nodding along, smiling, at times furrowing my brow, arching <laughs> one brow, shaking my head. Um, and, and that is, again, a mark of a book that makes you think. This book takes big swings. Um, it examines the rational actor assumption uh, in international relations and in foreign policy. But it does jarring things like ask the question, what do, me, what do we mean by the word rational? Stop for a second and ask yourself, well, I'm not precisely sure what my definition is. Um, it, it, it asks whether there's a good and shared definition of that term in the literature. It asks whether rational policies can fail, whether they can fail miserably. Um, and it asks what the implications of whether states behave rationally are for international relations and for the conduct of foreign policy, if we can or if we cannot assume that states generally behave rationally. Um, they provide answers to these questions, and they call on us to provide our own answers uh, if we disagree. So it's my great pleasure to introduce John J. Mearsheimer and our discussant today, a very distinguished scholar um, with interestingly uh, extensive experience in the policy community, which hopefully will afford uh, a unique purview into the conduct of states' behavior. John J. Mearsheimer is the R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago, where he's taught since 1982. He's received a multitude of awards and honors, including the Clark Award for Distinguished Teaching, the Quantrell Award for Distinguished Teaching from U of C in 85, and honorary doctorates from universities in China, Greece, and Romania. He was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2003 and received APSA's James Madison Award in 2020 for his scholarly contribution to political science. He's written extensively on international security affairs in venues from international security, foreign affairs, New York Times, Financial Times. Some of his many books include The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy with Stephen Walt, The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities, and today's How States Think uh, with Sebastian Rosado. He graduated from West Point in 1970 and served in the U.S. Air Force as an officer for five years, earned his Ph.D. in political science from Cornell in 1980. Dr. Ashley J. Tellis serves as the Tata Chair for Strategic Affairs and as a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's also a counselor at the National Bureau of Asian Research, the research director of the Strategic Asia program there, and co-editor of the Strategic Asia annual volume since 2004. He also serves as an advisor to the CNO, and during the presidency of George W. Bush, he was on the National Security Council staff as special assistant to the president and senior director for strategic planning in Southwest Asia. From 05 to 08, he served as senior advisor to the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs at the State Department, where he was a key figure in negotiating a civil nuclear agreement with India. He also served in the U.S. Foreign Service and as senior advisor to the ambassador to the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi. Before serving in government, he worked at the RAND Corporation as a senior policy analyst and worked as a professor of policy analysis at the RAND Graduate School. 
He specializes in U.S. foreign and defense policy with a focus on Asia, and in particular on the Indian subcontinent. He earned his PhD in MA in political science from the University of Chicago, and holds a bachelor's and master's in economics from the University of Bombay. So with that, I will turn the podium over first uh, to John J. Mearsheimer. John. Thank you very much, Justin, and thank you to all of you for coming out to hear me talk today. Uh, it's commonplace in the international relations literature today and in the public sphere for people to argue that states are irrational. Uh, that's not to say that everybody argues that or everybody argues that states are irrational all of the time. But you hear that more and more. And again, you see it in the scholarly literature as well. Sebastian Rosato and I thought this was not the case. Uh, first of all, if it is true, it has huge implications for international relations theory, because almost all international relations theories are based on the rational actor assumption. And if states are not rational, that's going to cause all sorts of problems for those theories. Furthermore, if you're in the real world, you're in the White House, you're making foreign policy, and you assume that you're dealing with a world that's filled with states that are irrational, how do you make policy? It's almost impossible. So our basic intuition to start with was that states are rational. And we decided we were going to investigate the issue. Now, what you have to understand, this is of great importance, is that to assess whether states are rational most of the time or irrational most of the time, you first of all have to have a clear definition of what rationality is. And it's remarkable how few people have a clear definition of what rationality is. But you can't assess whether states are rational without a clear definition of rationality. Okay? And then the second thing you have to do if you're going to engage in this enterprise, as Sebastian and I did, was you have to take that definition you have of rationality and run it up against the empirical record or the historical record to see whether states were actually rational according to the definition that you have. So that's the enterprise that we were engaged in. Now, when you look at the literature on rationality, there are two big literatures that are floating around out there. One is the rational choice literature, which is reflected in classical economics. And the other is the political psychology literature, which is reflected in behavioral economics, which is quite fashionable today. But you see people in political science, people who study IR, saying there has been a behavioral revolution in political science or in the study of IR. Those are people who fit in the political psychology camp. And then, of course, you have the rational choice people, which has also been a popular way of doing international relations scholarship over at least the last three decades. So these are the two bodies of literature that are out there. And the question you have to ask yourself is, how do they define rationality? Because you need that baseline, right? And it's quite clear that both of them rely on expected utility maximization. Now you're saying to yourself, what exactly is this? Let's just start with the rational choice literature. The rational choice literature says that states as act as if, and those words are very important, as if, they were expected utility maximizers. Now, what exactly is expected utility maximization? It's actually a magic formula. In many ways, it's a brilliant formula, but it's a magic formula that was invented by von Neumann and Morgenstern back in the middle 1940s. And it says that rationality is employment of expected utility maximization. An expected utility maximization involves coming up with different policies to deal with the problem. You've got this thing called the Soviet Union out there at the end of World War II, right? And you're not sure whether it's an aggressive state or it's a status quo power. And you come up with policies for dealing with the Soviet Union, right? And then when you marry the policies, right, with the problem, you come up with potential outcomes, okay? 
And what you do is you rank order those outcomes. In other words, one policy choice would be to contain the Soviet Union. Another policy choice would be to leave Europe and allow the Europeans to contain the Soviet Union. So you see the problem, how to deal with the Soviet Union, then there are different policies, and policies dealing with specific problems lead to different outcomes. So basically you get four outcomes in this story, and what you do is you rank order those outcomes, and you then assign probabilities, or how likely it is that each one of those outcomes will happen, you do some math that's not terribly complicated, and then you pick the outcome, right, that gives you the greatest benefit or maximizes your utility. Th that's what's involved here, right? And the argument is, in the international relations literature, among people who employ rational choice theory, that what states do is that they act as if they don't say they act as, they act as if they're expected utility maximizers. That's the definition of rationality. There are all sorts of problems with this. First of all, what does it mean to say that they act as if? They're not saying that if you look at how states behave, they act as expected utility maximizers. They're not saying that they actually use this formula to figure out what the policy options are and then decide on the best policy option. They say they act as if. So you have no sense of what the mental process is. And, and you all understand that rationality is a mental process, but it says nothing about the mental process. It just says they act as if. Another huge problem with this approach is that you cannot come up with objective probabilities in the social world, in international politics. You cannot come up with objective probabilities to assign to those four outcomes. This is a point that was made by John Maynard Keynes and Frank Knight two of the most famous economists of the 20th century. It's not some great insight on the past of, on the, uh, uh, by Sebastian Rosato and John Mearsheimer. You cannot come up with objective probabilities. This is widely recognized. So what you do is come up with subjective probabilities. Just to give you an example, how likely it is, how likely do you think it is that Vladimir Putin would use nuclear weapons if Russia were losing in the war in Ukraine. What do you think the probability is? 30%, 20%? You can't assign an objective probability. How can you know? You just can't know. So what you have to rely on are subjective probabilities. So the question is, where do you get subjective probabilities from? Basically, intu intuition, it's your gut. Get them off the top of your head, right? So you can't come up with objective probabilities. So you can't rank order the outcomes. This causes all sorts of problems. So our argument was that expected utility maximization just doesn't get you very far, because it doesn't tell you anything about the mental process that individuals go through. It's an as-if assumption, right? But furthermore, the actual formula doesn't work because you can't come up with objective probabilities. So that's the problem with rationality in the rational choice world. Then you go over to political psychology, right? In the political psychology world, they assume, just like the rational choice people do, that expected utility maximization, expected utility maximization is what rationality is. But there's one fundamental difference between the political psychology people and the rational choice people. The political psychology people look to see whether people actually act in accordance with the dictates of expected utility maximization. And unsurprisingly, they find that they don't. And they find that they don't 
for the same reason that the rational choice people use the as if assumption. They use the as if assumption because there's no evidence that people employ expected utility maximization. That's why the rational choice people or the classical economists use the as if assumption. So it's hardly surprising that the political psychologists find no evidence that people use expected utility maximization. So the question you have to ask yourself is where does this leave us? Well, for the political psychologists, from a logical point of view, this means that people never act rationally because they never employ expected utility maximization in an uncertain world. And IR is an uncertain world. So what do the political psychology people say? They say that people use heuristics and analogies all the time. Heuristics are basically rules of thumb. Now, the problem with this argument, I mean, there are lots of them. One is, do you think if you're in a crisis and you're the president of the United States, that you're not gonna think long and hard about how to get out of this crisis? I think you are. Do you think you're gonna use a simple rule of thumb? You're gonna use a simple heuristic or a simple-minded analogy? I don't think so. I think you're gonna think long and hard about what is the appropriate policy. Another problem with this approach that the political psychologists use, which revolves around heuristics, is much of the research on which the arguments are made is based on experiments in laboratories where they ask individuals what would they do in this situation and what would they do in that situation. Asking college students or even people who have high powered educations what they would do in a crisis is just a lot different than asking a policymaker in an actual crisis what he or she would do. So there's what we call in the social sciences a huge external validity problem here, right? Furthermore, when you look at the literature on heuristics, what you see is there's just a laundry list of heuristics, right? And you're never told which heuristics are the most important ones and which heuristics apply in this case or that case. So you don't have any sort of theory about how these heuristics fit together that allow you to take that panoply of heuristics and analyze particular cases. Then the final point that I would make to you is if you look at the cases, right? If you look at the cases, there's no evidence of people using heuristics. Or let me put it slightly differently. There's hardly any evidence of people using heuristics and certainly not in a systematic way. So when you look at the political psychology litter, literature, they're basically arguing people are rational almost all the time. But when you look at the actual behavior, which is based on the assumption that people are using these heuristics, you see no evidence of this. Just one final point before I move on to our approach to dealing with this whole issue. Uh, the political psychology people, by and large, this is in the IR field, they look at disasters. Anytime foreign policy ends up producing a disaster, people take that outcome and they reason backwards that it was a result of irrational or non-rational thinking. You cannot do that. We can talk more about that in the discussion later. You cannot equate outcomes with rationality. The fact is states can be rational and you can get a disastrous outcome. Rationality is a mental process. The question is what are people thinking about how to deal with a crisis, how to formulate a grand strategy. It's a mental process. It has little to do with outcomes because you understand that you can be very rational and unforeseen circumstances can complicate matters and produce a disaster or you can be very rational, but you can base your approach on bad information simply because you only had bad information. You didn't have the right information. So even though you were rational, you got a disastrous outcome. So you have to separate outcomes from the actual decision-making process. And what the political psychology people do is they focus on disastrous outcomes and then tell you this was the result of an irrational 
decision. And it's intuitively plausible. It seems to make sense. But you actually can't do that. So our argument is that expected utility maximization, using this magic formula in an uncertain world, right, is not a good definition of rationality. It just isn't. So what we did was we came up with our own definition of rationality. And our argument is that if you're going to come up with an explanation of rationality, you have to look at the individual level, right, the individual level, and then you have to look at the collective level, how those different individuals get together and come up with a final decision. Let's call that the state level, because we're talking here about whether states are rational or not, not whether individual leaders are rational, because states make collective decisions. Bill Clinton just doesn't decide all alone that he's going to pursue NATO expansion. He's talking to all sorts of his advisors. There's all sorts of input from other people. Okay, so the collective um, group matters. So our basic argument is that we are theoretical human beings, right? Homo theoreticus. People who focus on rational choice, classical economists, this is homo economicus. People who focus on political psychology, who focus, focus on heuristics, those are homo heuristicus. So you have homo heuristicus, homo economicus. We're homo theoreticus. Sebastian and I believe that human beings are theoretically oriented at the core. And when a state or an individual is thinking about how to deal with a foreign policy problem, you think about that problem in terms of the theories that you have in your head about how the world works. It's very important to understand that. Uh, and the question is whether the theories that people have in their head are credible theories you know, or non-credible theories. And our argument is you can break the theoretical world into credible theories and non-credible theories. The domino theory, for example, is a non-credible theory, okay? Uh, forcible democracy promotion, the idea that you could forcibly promote democracy and it's going to work. It's a non-credible theory. Then there are all sorts of credible theories of a realist sort and the liberal sort. So there are two bodies of theory here that produce a good number of credible theories. And our argument is that individuals, right, are rational, individuals are rational, when they have a credible theory that allows them to think about how to deal with a particular foreign policy problem, okay? Now, before I go to talking about the collective level, let me just say a few more, a few more words about credible theories. Uh, a lot of people who we talked to when we wrote this book believe that there's only one credible theory. That's my theory. <laughs> and therefore, any state that acts the way my theory says it should is rational. And if you don't, you're irrational or non-rational. This is not an argument you want to make. What, means, what this means is that two realists like Sebastian and I, who have particular theories about how the world works, are going to say that other realist theories that we disagree with and liberal theories are credible theories and therefore policies based on those credible theories are rational. It's very important to understand that. We are not arguing if you don't agree with us and you don't adopt our theories, you're irrational. That's not our argument. And let me give you a really good example that highlights this and is of relevance today when people talk about Ukraine. NATO expansion. There was a big battle in the 1990s. You guys both remember it very well over NATO expansion. On one side were the realists, people like George Kennan, uh, Bill Perry, who was the Secretary of Defense, and so forth and so on. They argued that NATO expansion was a fundamentally misguided idea 
because it would lead the Russians to balance and you'd have a disaster. On the other side were the liberals. And the liberals believed that you could expand NATO, you could expand the EU, and you could facilitate the color revolutions in Eastern Europe. You could pursue a set of liberal theories, right? Democratic peace theory, liberal institutionalism, and economic interdependence theory. That's what underpinned NATO expansion as it moved eastward. Those are theories that Sebastian and I disagree with. We think those theories are wrong, right? Because we're realists and we thought differently about NATO expansion. But we are not arguing that the ultimate decision to expand NATO, which was based on a body of three liberal theories, was irrational. It was not irrational. It was rational because it was based on three of the most prominent theories in international politics. So you see the argument that I'm making here? That you want to be very careful not to identify rationality with your favorite theory. The question is whether a theory is credible. And to have a theory be credible, you know, it has to have sound assumptions. It has to make empirical predictions for which there's quite a bit of evidence to support that prediction, and it has to have a sound causal logic. Democratic peace theory, for example, is a theory that is quite robust. As a good realist, I find democratic peace theory to be the most difficult of the liberal theories to argue against. You can't dismiss it. It is a rational theory, even though I think, and Sebastian certainly thinks, because he wrote a very prominent article on this, that it is a wrong-headed theory. Okay, now just very quickly, just to give you one example of a policy that we believe was non-rational. This is the decision to invade Iraq in 2003. And it was based on four theories, uh, a theory of victory, shock and awe, which we think was rational. It was based on democratic peace theory. I could go through the details, which we think was a rational theory, as I just made clear. But it was also based on two theories here I'm talking about the decision to invade Iraq. It's based on two theories that were not rational. One was democratic, uh, forced, forcible democ democracy promotion. Forcible democracy promotion. The idea that you could forcibly, uh, uh, forcibly push uh, Iraq to become a democracy. The theoretical literature on there is quite on, uh, literature on this is quite clear. And the other is the domino theory, right? The Bush. Doctrine as it applied to Iraq was based on the domino theory. Domino theory and forcible democracy promotion, not rational theories. So our argument is the Iraq case was not rational. The decision to expand NATO was rational because it was based on a body of liberal theories that are credible theories. So you see the importance to us of credible theories. Then there's the whole matter of deliberation, which you always want to remember when you're thinking about this question of whether states are rational, is that decisions are invariably made by a handful of people. Sebastian and I used to like to refer to a handful of people in the room. A number of key policymakers in almost every case make the decision. And in almost every case, not every case, but almost every case, they have different theories and therefore different policies because you understand John and Sebastian's argument is policy is based on theory. Policy is based on theory. So when you get in the room, you discover that people have different theories that they prefer and therefore different policy prescriptions. Think of the NATO expansion debate, okay? So the end result is that you have to have a collective decision-making process where People get to make their positions clear. Their arguments are not suppressed. It's a rational legal discussion, right? And the end result of this is if you get a policy that is based on a credible theory and it's done in a way where there's robust discussion at the collective level, it is rational. If you have a policy that is based on a non-credible theory or 
there's no deliberation or there's neither, then you have irrationality or non-rationality. Let me very briefly conclude by just talking about the evidence. We looked at 14 cases, 10 cases of rationality and four cases of non-rationality. What we did was we scoured the literature to find the cases that people who argued that states are irrational invariably turn to to make their case. We, we looked for those cases, okay? Then we put them up in bright lights and we examined them, okay? So we have 10 cases of rationality and we have four cases of non-rationality. As you all surely understand, there are, are many, many cases that we could have investigated, but given time constraints, that was impossible. So again, what we did was we focused on these 14 cases, and we went to great lengths to show that our definition of rationality actually quit fit, excuse me, fit quite neatly with those 14 cases, and that in those 14 cases, you saw little evidence of policymakers using heuristics, and you, of course, saw little evidence of policymakers using expected utility maximization. And for that reason, we felt that we came up with a quite convincing argument but whether or not that is true depends on how you interpret my presentation and the book. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Justin, and thank you, John, uh, for giving me the opportunity to actually speak to you this afternoon about John's book. In the uh, interest of truth in advertising, I have to let you know that once upon a time I was John's student. <laughs> I studied at the University of Chicago, but that, of course, will not prevent me from uh, <laughs> offering a critical view of the book that John just presented. Let me start with the headline conclusion. The headline conclusion is that John's assessment of whether states are fundamentally rational in international politics is correct. It is correct at a deductive level, particularly if the state has managed to survive, because if it has not survived, that itself is proof of non-rational action. But it is also correct at the empirical level because of the processes that John has described. But let me pull back and try and revisit the question of rationality actually from a more conceptual standpoint. It is to John's credit and Sebastian's credit that they've taken on what in social science has hitherto been largely an assumption. But there is a good reason why rationality has been treated as an assumption rather than as something to be problematized and explained. If social science is about generating universal laws across space and time that cover large numbers of individual instances, then I would argue that you do not have the luxury of problematizing rationality. You simply assume that rationality exists and then focus on understanding what the products of that rationality are in terms of outcomes. And those outcomes then become the yardsticks by which social science explanation proceeds. In other words, whether you problematize rationality or simply assume it really depends 
on whether your intellectual enterprise is focused on universals or universal explanations, or whether it is focused on making sense of particulars. If you are focused on creating universal explanations, you can get by simply by treating rationality as an assumption whose proof of existence or non-existence is determined simply by the aggregate outcomes and whether those aggregate outcomes essentially are consistent with our own experience. If your interest, on the other hand, is about explaining particulars in any detail, then you do not have the luxury of simply assuming rationality. You have to problematize it, you have to test for its existence, and you have to probe for its effects. Now, John and Sebastian have a great argument as to why what economists do, which is, for example, derive universal laws of demand across time, across space, across countries, across all actors, are not necessarily the best way to conduct examinations of international politics. Because politics is about life and death. The cases involving life and death are just too many. They are too heterogeneous. And the actions of states are too diverse. And therefore, an examination of rationality requires a more, fine, a more finer grained analysis. And that's what this book sets out to do. And in my judgment, at a conceptual level, it actually succeeds quite brilliantly. It's an innovative way of thinking about rationality, at least where instrumental rationality is concerned. Now, we have to remember that there is a distinction between substantive rationality and instrumental rationality, a distinction that goes back to Max Weber. Substantive rationality is about what is the appropriate goal that the agent needs to pursue in a given situation. That goal is always defined by a theory. It is the theory that defines what is appropriate to pursue in a given circumstance. Instrumental rationality is means ends rationality. Once I understand what is the appropriate goal to be pursued, instrumental rationality tells me that X is a better way to achieve that outcome rather than Y. And so you need to make that distinction. John's book and Sebastian's book focuses very much on the instrumentality of rationality because they presume that substantive rationality or what they define as goal rationality is essentially defined by a realist theory of politics and that usually means that states, at the minimum, have to pursue survival. And if states, at a minimum, have to pursue survival as the goal that is appropriate in conflictual politics, then the only issue that actually remains to be discerned is whether they, the means they use to pursue that goal are appropriate to their circumstances or not. Then, of course, you get to the question of OK, so how do we judge the appropriateness of those choices? And John and Sebastian's argument is essentially a process argument, and it is an internal argument. It is a process argument because it emphasizes the preeminence of having credible theories married to a deliberative process. But it is an internal argument in that they are consciously seeking to create a disjuncture between that process and the outcomes for the reasons that John explained very persuasively. That is, even rational people can be unsuccessful. Even rational policies may not deliver the ends that they seek. And so at a purely logical level, it does not require success to be part of any definition of rationality.
Having said this, however, the little angels on my shoulder are nervous because there is in my judgment an implicit criterion of success that is implicit in the formulation and that has to do with the credibility of theory. I don't think it is possible to escape the questions of the effectiveness of policy from the success of policy entirely. You can do it at a formal level as John tries to do, which is focus on process, focus on deliberation, and so on and so forth. But in my judgment, you can't quite escape the issue of success. And you can't escape the issue of success because it is implicit in his component of credible theory. What is it that makes a theory credible? What makes a theory credible is that it is a more accurate reflection of the world compared to some alternative theory. If that is true, then acting in consonance with that theory should produce outcomes that are closer to what the practitioner who uses that theory seeks. And that constitutes success. Now, that may not always be the case, because the world is extremely complicated. And sometimes, we do not have the information we require. But I was wondering, as I read the book, whether there is a way to maintain a connection with the outcome, and a successful outcome in particular, and still protect John's intellectual project, which is to define rationality in terms of process. That is the application of credible theories and deliberation, rather than throwing the baby out with bathwater. That is making success completely foreign to the project. And I think this is an interesting question to think about, because if I were confronted with two theories, both of which have equal or comparable explanatory power, but one theory promises a successful outcome compared to the other theory, it would be irrational of me not to pursue the theory that promises the successful outcome. Now, this argument is by no means a fundamental refutation of the project that John and Sebastian are about. But I think we need to reconsider the issue of how success or successful outcomes figure implicitly in the methodology rather than holding hard and fast to a sharp distinction between process and outcomes. The second issue that I was uncomfortable with, but whose logic I appreciate, because the most devastating criticism in the book is actually against the school of political psychology. Because I do not find the logic persuasive, and I find it extremely hard to find replication of that processes in actual policy making. But the question of rational choice is a little more complicated. Rational choice as defined as rational choice theorists do, I think is problematic. Because it is a world, as John and Sebastian point out, that is much more attuned to risk where probabilities can be assigned than it is to a world of uncertainty where it is impossible to assign probabilities. But I would still contend that even though rational choice it may not be defensible as a methodology for making choices in international politics, in effect, policymakers end up pursuing approximations of rational choice or pseudo-rational choice. In other words, policymakers seek to understand what goals they want to pursue, they want to look at the alternative means they have to the pursuit of those goals. And they judge the benefits and costs that are attendant to each of those alternatives. 
Now this may not be rational choice in the strict sense of the word because you cannot put numerical utilities. But the process of simply filtering out which choices are potentially more expensive for me, which choices are more likely to succeed, mimics in some sense a, rash, a ratiocinative process. And I think you can construct an approximation of rational choice that might be defensible even in an international politics world. Something to think about. The third and last issue uh, that occurred to me as I was reading the book was the issue of the deliberative process. I think uh, John and Sebastian's description of the del deliberative process in politics is absolutely critical because the surest way to failure is to make decisions based simply on intuitions or crazy notions which are not tested in a community of people who are well informed about the circumstances. So deliberation is absolutely critical. But I'm not sure, at least at a theoretical level, whether deliberation in policy really account, really entails an aggregation problem of preferences. In other words, I'm not sure, as sociologists would argue, that there is actually a micro, macro problem with respect to deliberation, which some parts of the book seem to suggest might be entailed. At the end of the day, there is a point in John and Sebastian's book, which I think is really the critical point. There is a single decision maker, even in complex state systems. And while that single decision maker ought to accept the advice, accept the ideas of others in the room, at the end of the day, choices are made by a single individual. And that single individual and the formation of the choices of that sing single individual, I do not think can be reduced to an aggregation problem. In other words, the logic of the unitary actor is highly defensible even in a complex sociological environment like the state, where there are a multiplicity of influences that bear on decision making. The final point I want to make has to do with justification. Everything I've said so far bears on the question of how you explicate or how you describe rationality and its consequences. The issue of justification which is in retrospect, when I look at the evidence, can I defend the conclusion that some actions or some choices were rational and other choices were not, I think is a tad more complicated than the book may suggest. And it's a tad more complicated precisely because of one of the arguments that the book makes very explicitly which is that all our evidence, all our observations, are theory-conditioned observations. We do not have a way of apprehending brute facts. Facts that we think exist by themselves make sense only to the degree that there is an overarching conceptual framework that enables us to understand those facts as such. Now, if this is true, then it makes the challenge of justifying one's conclusions extremely hard. Because what John and Sebastian would count as historical evidence that confirms their hypothesis, that same piece of evidence could be interpreted using a different conceptual framework to reach different conclusions. In other words, while I want 
John's arguments to be right. And I believe at an intuitive level that most of them, if not all of them are, I find it extremely hard to justify the veracity of that claim given the methodological constraints that surround all the data that we have to use. The thing that makes social science so difficult was Kant's original understanding that we bring to reality not just a relationship between subject and object, which is divided by a huge gap, but we bring to the relationship between subject and object an intrinsic connectivity which comes because the thinking subject helps constitute the object. And the thinking subject helps con constitute the object through theory. That allows us to understand the world, but it also simultaneously makes it much harder for us to claim exclusive explanations about what the facts in the world actually are. And so I think while the book does a superb job of laying the foundations for why we ought to think of rational action in the way that we do, and in the way that John and Sebastian elaborate, I think when this book and the cases are essentially presented to the body of scholars or to observers, I think there will be much greater contentiousness about their specific conclusions. Not because their conclusions are necessarily wrong, but because the evidentiary base on which they draw those conclusions are by definition invariably ambiguous. Thank you very much. John, did you want to take the opportunity to respond, or would you prefer to weave in responses to Dr. Tellis uh, throughout? Either way, it's your. I'd actually just like to respond, uh, to respond, in large part because uh, it was a fascinating <laughs> and sophisticated uh, set of comments. Uh, as I said to Justin earlier, uh, I've been at the University of Chicago for 42 years, and we've had lots of graduate students, very smart graduate students, come through. And I can assure you that Ashley, as he just demonstrated, is one of the smartest graduate students to ever come through the University of Chicago, which is not to say he's right on all counts. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to make a couple points. First of all, just your last point, which is music to our ears, when he was talking about how difficult it is to assess different theories in a world where the data is really messy, the facts are really messy. And I just want to emphasize, that's why we said there are multiple credible theories. You can't just take all the theories that are out there, run them up against the historical record, and say, this is the correct theory. So I, I just want to um, reinforce that point. But let me make an argument, and I'd be curious to know what you have to say about this. I think in a very important way, Ashley and I think about this whole subject of rationality in fundamentally different ways. And you started off by saying uh, that you don't, uh, it's, it's not necessary to have a definition of rationality, right? As soon as I hear that, it's not necessary to have a definition of rationality. He's making the as if argument. Mm. That, that's the argument that he's making. You can simply assume that actors, whether they're individuals or states, or states, are rational. All the assumptions don't have to be true, right? They don't have to be true. And this was Milton Friedman's mm -hmm. famous argument, yep. as you know. He made this loudly and clearly. And we're making the argument, Sebastian and I, because we are what are called scientific realists, right? That's not like realism and IR. It just 
to say that Ashley and I come from different universes on this issue, right? Where we think that those assumptions, and we're talking about the rational actor assumption in particular, has to be correct, that individuals have to think rationally. And what he's saying, don't worry about defining rationality, just assume that they act as if they're rational. And what really matters are the outcomes, how well the theory predicts the outcome. And John and Sebastian are saying, take outcomes and put them over there. We're not interested in outcomes, we're interested in process. He's not that interested in process. He's not interested in defining rationality. He's interested in outcomes. And that's the way most economists operate, mm -hmm. classical economists for sure. But it's a fundamentally different way of thinking about this issue than Sebastian and I are employing. And that's why I think in some ways it appeared from his comments that we were two ships passing in the night, which is not to denigrate his approach or his comments at all, but just to make it clear uh, what's going on here. Uh, so I have two questions for you, uh, assuming that you agree with what I just said, which you seem to, but I'd be curious if you don't. My first question is, do you have a definition of rationality, or do you just think it's not necessary? And in a funny way, we're tilting at windmills here. Uh, and then my second question is, you went to the University of Chicago, and when you were there especially, it was theory land. By our theory was God, right? Uh, and uh, how do you think about theory, given that you were basically employing expected utility maximization, right? And if you listen to almost everything you said, expected utility maximization is all about lining up different uh, options, different outcomes, assigning costs, benefits, probabilities, and so forth and so on. It's a fundamentally different way of thinking about the world, right? That's homo economicus. This is homo theoreticus. And just for purposes of the audience, I think it would be really very helpful if you could sort of respond to my responses to you so we can just be perfectly clear on the differences in how we think about this issue. So let me go back to the substantive versus instrumental rationality question when you talk about what is your definition of rationality. I do not think we can identify goal rationality uh, through a process that is atheoretical. So you need some theory. The theory is the, uh, the international system is conflictual, it puts a premium on survival, therefore the goal must be to survive and to dominate or what have you. Right? So those goal, goal rationality is defined essentially by a theory. But instrumental rationality, which is what I'm interested in, is simply about trying to figure out what is the most appropriate means to achieving that goal. And to do that, I have to have, obviously, some theory about how the world works, but some theory about costs and benefits that are attendant on my choices. Now, I may not be able to put numbers in terms of describing what those costs and benefits are, but there must be some intuition that a policymaker has that if I choose A and I choose wrongly, the costs of that choice will be horrendous and unacceptable, as opposed to choosing B, where the losses associated with that choice might be much more acceptable. So we may not be able to put actual digits to these assessments, but intuitively, we must have a way of calculation. But would you agree that that is expected utility maximization? I mean, whatever you call it is immaterial, right? The point is I'm maximizing some benefit against a known constraint or against a hypothesized constraint. So how I do it, whether I do it intuitively, whether I do it mathematically, is sort of less important. The point I'm making is, 
you cannot get away from the maximization logic, whether you, you do that maximization through computation or whether you do it through intuition. But what would you say to my argument that we're all theoretical human beings? Yes. And when we look at the world, whether we're in a crisis or formulating grand strategy, right, what we do is we bring our theories about how the world works and why it works that way to formulate policies, right? So if you and I are asked to deal with a particular, you know, the rise of China, yes. you have a particular theory in your head yes. that informs your thinking. I have a particular theory in my head that informs my thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's the argument that Sebastian and I are driving home. But you seem to disagree with that. No, I don't disagree with that. I think the issue is not about theory, because we both agree that you need an overarching theory. It's the theory that suggests what is appropriate. The point I'm making is theories do not produce single exit choices. That is, a theory is not an algorithm where once you spin it, it automatically tells you what choices you have to pursue. I mean, it gives you a range of choices, right? And because it gives you a range of choices, you have to bring to the process some intuitions about benefits and costs across the alternatives. So we're not disagreeing about the theory. You need the theory. But if the theory spat out one optimal choice, it would be easy. No theory in social science spins out one optimal choice for the very simple reason that we do not have enough information about our initial conditions, that is, you know, what describes my circumstances relative to that of my competitors. And I do not understand what the other players in that relationship will play. So the world is very complex, and so I have a variety of choices from a single theory. And if I'm confronted with a variety of choices, then I have to make judgments about which of these choices offers a higher probability of success, or at least a lower uh, burden of costs. And I think you cannot escape that ratiocinative process, even if you have a theory. And to my mind, that is what rational choice is about. I'm not talking about rational choices, you know, expected utilities with people calculating probabilities to utilities. That's a formalization of the process. The intuition that underlies rational choices, I have a series of alternatives. I need to test for the consistency of those alternatives relative to my goals. And I have to make some judgments about what the payoffs and what the burdens of each of those choices for my interests are. I'll make a, just a final point, then go to you and go, definitely go to the audience. I, I think what you're doing here is you're running our approach together with expected utility maximization. And you're employing theories as a way of coming up with what the options are, right? And I don't think you can run the two together. I think they're two fundamentally different enterprises. The other point I would make to you is if you look at all of the cases, I think that theory basically leads to one policy choice. Your argument is if you have a theory, you have all these different options, then you do expected utility maximization. This is him running the two approaches together. I actually think if you have a simple theory, and theories by definition are simple, so I should just say if you have a theory, if you have a theory, the policy prescription in almost all cases is straightforward. And what you get is a fight between the rival theories and the rival policies. But that's my <laughs> final point. Let me briefly usurp the moderator's privilege before I democratize this thing and throw it open to everybody else. Um, hopefully it will warm your heart to, 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 to hear that once I saw the introduction of this concept of credible theories in the text, the alarm bells in my head started going off and said the whole book rises or falls on this credible theories. Con this, is, this is the beating heart of, of your it's concept of rationality. This is the whole, the whole story. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And so you, you went through carefully, and I think uh, uh, pluralistically um, did a taxonomy of credible theories, of non-credible theories, why you thought they were credible, why you thought they were non-credible. Um, and in so doing, I think you, you relied by and large on peer-reviewed scholarly IR literature. Um, and so I wanted to push you a little bit on, on how you thought um, that went. So is, is, for example, some of the cases went back to before the Great War, right? So were the theories that were credible in 1911 determined by the state of the peer-reviewed scholarly literature in 1911 uh, of the consensus of scholars? Would a consensus of scholars in the peer-reviewed IR literature today, do you think, agree with your taxonomy of credible and non-credible theories. And then a secondary sort of spin-off of that is, you know, you drive home the point forcefully that if we live in a world where states aren't by and large rational most of the time, it's sort of inconceivable to do international relations or to do foreign policy because you're just the proverbial drunk monkey throwing darts at the dartboard. But you're so pluralistic in including so many possible credible theories that an opponent or a prospective ally could be using. Talk a little bit about how assuming rationality, if a prospective opponent has this huge quiver of many plausible theory or credible theories that he or she could be reaching for, how does rationality help scholars or policymakers that much if there are so many credible theories? Yeah, uh, his, I'll go with his last, there are two arguments there. The, the last one is the low bar argument, right? That, that uh, almost anything a state does is uh, rational because there's so many, uh, uh, so many credible theories. Uh, and then the first point was, were these policymakers really aware of the scholarly literature? You, guys talk about the scholarly literature. Was Admiral, was Admiral von Tirpitz uh, reading uh, the latest uh, uh, version of the American Political Science Review? That, that's, that's the first question, but I'll take him in reverse order. Uh, when we wrote the book, we had multiple meetings with people uh, over the internet, uh, as we describe in the preface to the book. And we were hit a number of times with the low bar argument. This is the argument that it's so easy to argue that states are rational because there are so many credible theories. Um, first of all, we looked at 14 cases, and four of them are cases of non-rationality. So there are a good number of cases of non-rationality out there. It's not like we're arguing that it's <coughs> rationality all the time when you look at the cases. In terms of uh, non-credible uh, non theories, we laid out eight non-credible theories, which are quite prominent theories in some cases, like the domino theory, uh, audience costs, nuclear coercion theory. Lots of people believe that nuclear coercion uh, works, and the literature is very clear that nuclear coercion doesn't work, uh, and so forth and so on. So, so there are a good number of theories. Now, his argument is, but you have all these credible theories. <coughs> I don't think that we have that many credible theories. We have a handful of realist theories and a handful of liberal theories. And these are time-honored theories. They've been around for a long time. Uh, basic balance of power logic sure. is out there. And if you look at Admiral Tirpitz, I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that's the, the most uh, ancient case that we exactly. have, right? A Admiral Tirpitz is a case in, in Germany uh, before World War I with its naval policy. The risk strategy <coughs> uh, was a case of uh, irrationality or non-rationality. Right. Uh, the argument against the risk strategy was just basic, basic balance of power right. logic. And, you know, go back to Thucydides, it's right. there, Hobbes, balance of power logic. And risk theory was not a credible theory, and all sorts of people said that at the time. And this actually, so, so my point is, I, I, don't think, I don't think there's a low bar here. Just look at the cases and, and look at the, the body of theories, right? Uh, but this brings us to his first point, to Justin's first point, 
just on policymakers. It, it's quite interesting <coughs> that when you sort of look at how policymakers talk, right, and, and the options that they see on them, see in front of them, they are based in simple theories. They don't based on simple theories, they don't reference the scholarly literature. You're not going to see that. But if you look, for example, at the French and the question of how to deal with Adolf Hitler in the late 1930s, mainly in 1938, right? And you want to understand, it was not clear what Adolf Hitler represented in 1938. And just how aggressive he was was not clear. So you had basically three bodies of thought inside the French foreign policy decision-making elite. And one was basically a defensive realist mm -hmm. interpretation of the case, which is that he had limited aims, and if we could satisfy him in early 38 by letting him take Austria and then give him the Sudetenland at Munich, <coughs> that would be the end of it, right? Uh, he understood full well that trying to conquer Europe would lead to a World War I-like situation. Then you had the offensive realists, people like me, who believe, assume the worst case and move in and deal with this guy as quickly as possible. So there's sort of an offensive realist and a defensive realist camp, and then there are people in between who go back and forth who can't make up their mind. But you could very clearly uh, see them thinking in terms of these theories. My final example, I once won a book award for <coughs> Tragedy of Great Power Politics. Uh, it was a book award from Georgetown University. And at the dinner where I was given the award, I sat next to Madeleine Albright. And during the course of the dinner, Madeleine Albright, who was very nice to me, said uh, she was uh, glad that I won this book award. But she said, all this theory stuff uh, is <laughs> beside the point in her world. She said she had no interest in theory. So I said to her, you know, I said, that's really interesting because I use you in all my classes as a policymaker who is profoundly affected by theory. You could see the smoke coming out of her ears, right? She was saying, what is this guy saying? So she said to me, she said, explain to me what you mean by that. So I said, if you look at your views on NATO expansion, on liberal hegemony, on almost every foreign policy issue, you explain your policies on the basis of the three canonical liberal theories. It's really quite remarkable the extent to which Madeleine Albright, time after time, turns to those liberal theories. And here she is as a person saying to me, I have no <laughs> yeah. use for theory, yeah. Yeah. right? So the argument that Sebastian and I are making, and I think both these guys agree with me completely, is we are theoretical human beings. And we view the world in terms of theories. And you all want to think about that. And you want to think <clears throat> about Ashley's last point, because it's of enormous importance. The world is incredibly complicated. The only way we can make sense of it is with theory. But we find it extremely difficult to adjudicate among those theories. Mm -hmm. We have a quote from Paul Krugman in the book that makes exactly that point. He, of course, is an economist, and he understands that in the world of economics, as in the world of IR, trying to figure out which theory is right and which theory is wrong. Enough said. Very good. I'm going to go, because I screwed up last time and went to the audience last. I'm going to go to the physical audience first and then to the internet second. Um, I have people with microphones coming around. Please don't grab the microphone. They will hold it for you very gently. Um, and uh, let's start right there. Um, please introduce yourself, any affiliation that you have, and let it rip with a question. Thank you very much. I'm with the Embassy of Denmark, and I studied Mersheimer at the University of Copenhagen. <laughs> um, I just wanted to relate your theory to a very uh, explosive situation happening right now in Nagorno-Karabakh. And how would you make sense of the situation? And if you were a political advisor to the leadership who just fled, what would your recommendation be? But it's an interesting question because <laughs> I'm not sure whether you're asking me to assess whether the Armenians or the Azerbaijanis have been rational or not, <laughs> or you're asking me what the policy should be. 
uh, I tend to think that probably both sides were rational. Uh, and I want to underline here that I don't have any uh, hard evidence to support what I'm going to say, but this is my guess. My sense is that balance of power logic informed both sides and that the Azerbaijanis understood that the balance of power was clearly in their favor and not in Armenia's favor. And given that they wanted Nagorno back, they said, this is the time to act. The Armenians, I think, understood full well that to stand and fight on this issue did not make sense given where the balance of power uh, was at. And therefore, they conceded and did nothing to help protect those Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh and instead helped facilitate their exit out of there. So my guess would be as distasteful as many people on the Armenian side find this outcome, the actual decision-making process was probably, and I underline the word probably, rational. Let's go, there was a question somewhere back there, right there, the gentleman with his hand up. Uh, yes, my name is Roger Cochetti. I'm an editorial contributor to the Hill newspaper. And both of you gave, uh, I think, appropriate emphasis to the absence of fact or absence of intelligence or absence of knowledge of the whole situation. But it seems to me this is not an important consideration. It is the central consideration. If Saddam Hussein, Tojo, Adolf Hitler, name your head of state who's lost, knew everything that was going to happen, had all of the facts, not some of them, not many of them, not a few of them, but all of the facts, then they wouldn't have acted in the way they did. They thought that, if I can use Donald Rumsfeld's taxonomy, it is, they thought that the known knowns were 80%, the unknown, the known unknowns were 10%, and the unknown unknowns were 10%, when in fact, the unknown unknowns were 90%, and that the real issue for policymakers or IR analysts is how much of the problem you're facing consists of unknown unknowns. Because if it's 90% unknown unknowns, you're in trouble. But if it's 10% unknown unknowns, then you can make a rational decision so think about fighting some alien who comes down and looks like a cloud and you know nothing about them. And they seem to be just eating everybody up or something. And it's 99% unknown unknowns. You are in trouble. But if I'm fighting a pack of wolves and I know exactly what they do and how to deal with them, I have 5% unknown unknowns and I could deal with them. So this f access to thorough information seems to me to be the central consideration, and you both do point it out, but it, it, it's not as central as it seems to me in, in your analysis. Thank you. Yeah, I, let me go first, and yeah. Ashley should definitely jump in here. Uh, if you look at the book, we agree with you 100%, right? We live in an uncertain world. It's important to understand that in, in the literature on risks, there are three different worlds. A certain world, that's where you know everything. Then there's a risk world. A risk world is where you can assess objective probabilities, and therefore you can assess objective risk. This is true in the insurance business. If you want to get insurance on your house, right, which is on the edge of a cliff, there's this huge database that the insurance company has about houses on cliffs, and they can make all sorts of estimates about the probability your house will fall off the cliff. They can come up with objective probabilities. That's a risk world. And I want to be very clear here. Expected utility maximization, the, the magic formula, is ideally suited to a risk world. Okay, So there's a certain world, a risk world. The problem is that the social world that economists and political scientists operate in is an uncertain world. In keeping with what this gentleman said and with what Ashley said in his final comments. And you're absolutely right that 
this is why I argue and Sebastian argues that the outcomes cannot be used to judge rationality because there are just so many factors that you don't know about out there. And furthermore, as I said in my formal presentation, you could have bad information and you end up in the deep kimchi even though you were rational in our story. I, I agree with the, with the nature of the way you define the problem. The difficulty I have with John's response is that rationality becomes purely a formal element, which is I'm simply applying a calculus based on a theory, and if I apply the calculus appropriately, it deserves the label rational, and that's the end of it. And that's fine. But when it comes to actual policy making, it's not sufficient to satisfy an abstract criteria of rationality. I need to have some assessment of whether my rational choices are going to yield the results that I'm pursuing. And if I cannot make that connection, between the choices suggested as appropriate by my theory with the outcomes that I finally have to cope with, the fact that I, my choices were a priori rational because they were consistent with my theory is a very little consolation. And so that's the problem that I've been struggling with in the reading of the book, which is no matter how much you want to protect the logic of rationality in the face of failure, right? And that is a laudable objective. You want to protect that because there will be situations where no matter how rational you are, you don't get the outcome you want. But I'm not sure whether that logic then allows you to simply dissolve the question of success. Because in the policy world, that is all that matters. I mean, when statesmen make decisions, they're not making decisions because they have to satisfy a philosopher's concern with what is rational. They're making decisions which are intended to produce certain outcomes that advance either their particular interests or the interests of the state. And so that's where the rubber sort of hits the road. Let me go to the, the internet here, which I have in my palm of my hands. I'll bring in two questions which may or may not be quick. Um, Tyler Koteski asks on the app formerly known as Twitter, um, in decisions assessed as non-rational, particularly where credible and non-credible theories both factor in, I think he's referencing the Iraq case that you referenced earlier. How do the authors weigh which theories matter more overall in making the choice rational or not? Is the involvement of one non-credible theory sufficient? Similarly, so you had, I think, two credible and two non-credible, and you called the decision non-credible. Why is plus two, minus two, make it non-credible, I think is the question. How does the amalgam of credible and non-credible theories add up in your calculus of the decision? Similarly, would the authors endorse existing frameworks frequently being subject to inaccurate or inadequate information? And then my colleague John Mueller, via some sort of more old-fashioned uh, tech technology, says, in a recent book about invading Iraq, historian Melvin Leffler concludes that Bush, quote, was unable to grasp the magnitude of the enterprise he was embracing, the risks that adhered in it, and the costs that would be incurred, end quote. Was that decision rational? So I think you've already answered what was the decision rational, uh, but John is, is, is adding Leffler's judgment, I think, that, that Bush was lacking, uh, well, I won't editorialize, lacking uh, the ability to grasp the magnitude. Um, so two questions more or less related to Iraq. Yeah, I'll take them uh, in the order they came up. Uh, I actually don't think that Sebastian and I talked about uh, how you yeah. would uh, assess uh, uh, whether or not you needed one theory alone to produce non-rationality <laughs> or not. My intuition is that we agreed uh, implicitly that if there was one non-credible theory that was at the core of yeah. the policy, that would be non-rational. Yeah. In the Iraq case, it's important to emphasize that the decision-making process itself was flawed, was flawed yeah. right? Uh, and there, 
President Bush was not the key decision maker. It was Vice President Cheney who was really driving that train. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at the decision making process, it, it was not. Uh, it was not rational. Well, and you even one of the credible theories that you credit, the shock and awe, is sort of a narrower military question. It's not a you know, high-level question of strategy. It's a question of military operations, where they said, well, this is the way that we're going to conduct, conduct the military operations, which maybe couldn't vindicate the, the, the broader uh, problems of the, uh, the strategy itself. Well, no, I, I, look, when we went into Iraq, there was the whole question of what was their theory of victory. In other words, n toppling Saddam Hussein from power. That's number one. And then the second question is what's your theory as to what happens after you own the place, right? And we actually believed that uh, we would be able to forcibly promote democracy in Iraq despite the fact that the evidence of democracies like the United States doing this show very clearly that forcible democracy promotion doesn't work. And then the Bush doctrine was based on the domino theory. And the idea was that once we knocked off Saddam Hussein, maybe we'd have to knock off one more leader. Maybe we'd have to do Syria or Iran. But then bandwagoning logic, uh, the domino theory would set in, and the whole region would go democratic, right? And then once we got a democratic Middle East, once that domino theory worked, democratic peace theory would kick in. And our argument is that the theory of victory, if you looked at how they planned the operation, shock and awe, it was a rational strategy. And democratic peace theory is a rational strategy. But the two right. in between, right? And I think I'd have to talk to Sebastian to know for sure. But I think you only need one irrational strategy. Uh, now, with regard to John, uh, I, I've not read the Leffler book, I must confess. Uh, but I don't think that George Bush was the key decision maker here, right? And it, it, what really matters is the overall decision making process that was orchestrated by Dick Cheney. And as I said a minute ago, and I don't think this is something that many people would disagree about, it was a discombobulated decision making process. It's not the way you want to make decisions. They were not interested in letting everybody have their fair say. They were not interested in listening to dissenters. They were suppressing evidence and so forth and so on. Uh, so from that point of view, it was, uh, it, it was not a rational policy and therefore uh, the theory underpinning was not rational. Let me rescue my moderation of this thing by uh, making clear that there are books for sale. Um, we used to, in the olden days, we always used to make sure that we had a box of books for sale. Now everyone does everything on the internet. Um, but there are outside uh, books for sale here. Um, I want to thank here uh, John J. Mearsheimer for coming in from Chicago uh, to give the book. I want to thank Ashley Tellis for giving a uh, very Sharp edge, Chicago, Chicago? reminiscent, yes. if I can say. Three Chicago um, <laughs> remarks. And I want to thank all of you for showing up here this afternoon. Um, again, buy the book, engage with it. I think, you know, agree, disagree, partially agree. Um, it really is a book that makes you think, uh, that makes you consider the themes. Um, and thank you for coming out to our forum this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.